Keeping It Green is made possible by cooperation with Chippewa Valley Community Television and the UW Extension Office. Today on Keeping It Green, we visit with a tree care professional to learn about landscaping techniques to take care of trees and shrubs. Welcome to this episode of Keeping It Green. I'm Erin LaFave, your host, and today we're here with John Stuvey of Tree Savvy. Thank you for joining us today, John. Thank you for having me. We have a tangle of um, bushes and trees and such behind us. Um, can you just go through the process that you would use to determine if any of this should stay or go or what is in here? Sure. Um, first, we determine um, exactly what it is that's all growing here. And what we have here are most of this is voluntary stuff the birds have planted. Um, the mulberry, they like to eat mulberries and then they drop the seeds and up come mulberry trees. Um, it's a very small one, but it's a lot cheaper to get out now while it's still small than when it's 40 feet tall. Um, and then you come over to the hydrangea here, which has buckthorn growing in it, box alder growing in it, hackberry growing behind it. Uh, so we'd be looking at removing all of those as well. Um, and, and trying to get everything back under control. And those are all volunteer ones too, planted by squirrels and birds and such? Correct. Mm -hmm. And there's a number of hackberries in the neighborhood, so I know that's where that seed came from. The, there's a couple of huge buckthorn on either side of the property, and clearly that's where those have come from. If they were in a proper position, this might be nice because they grow fast, most of these trees. But what are some of the problems with having these trees growing right in the corner of this house. Well, your, your hackberry closest to the foundation and house here, that tree can get to be three feet in diameter. Um, and they grow, uh, that one looks like it's put on four feet this year. So they can grow very fast and get out of control in a hurry. So the right tree in the right spot, the hackberry would be a good boulevard tree, not one next to the house. Uh, the box alder, that's one you find out in swamps and in the woods. And that's not something you'd even plant in a yard. Buckthorns and invasive, not something anybody wants, um, very aggressive. And the mulberry, um, again, in the woods is a better place. When they drop their berries, they're quite a mess. And it can also get quite large. So eliminate anything that's going to get large real close to the house and have it in the right spot further away. So what would be more well suited for this area? Uh, your shrubs would be a better choice. Um, and with windows and in a college part of town, maybe you want something more defensive to keep people away from the windows, something with thorns, a barberry or something of that sort. Um, low flowering shrubs, um, rhododendron, something that has some flowers in the spring, um, but definitely not trees this close to the house. So what are uh, some of the first things you would start with in this project when you, what kind of tools would you use? Well, we have, for getting in with all these small things, we have a couple of different hand pruner, hand saw that can fit in between without damaging the shrub we want to keep. Um, on something like the mulberry out here that's a little bit bigger, we'd use a small chainsaw um, to cut that out. Now, if you just cut it out and leave it, it's going to grow right back. Um, so it either needs to then be pulled out, dug out, have the stump ground, or poison the stump with a stump killer. Otherwise, you're just delaying the inevitable and having more stuff growing back in there that you don't want. Because these regenerate very well without much of anything. Growing. Absolutely. You cut a buckthorn off, and next year you have 10 buckthorns coming out of that same stump. Even if you put poison on it sometimes. <laughs> oh, yeah, sometimes it uh, even defeats your poison. Yeah. All right, well, we can start getting ready and let's, we'll watch your process. We'll cut some trees down. Okay, I guess we'll start with the noisemaker. How do you know that one's gone four feet, or do you say four feet this year? Guessing based on that clear stem. Oh, okay. That hasn't put on a lot of branches past that point. Yeah. 
Can I use the handsaw to take this one out? You sure can. Oh, yes. So exciting. <laughs> well, I don't know which way I want to go, but... It cuts on the pole, so... I got a ton of these in my yard, too. <laughs> Well, I think we've eliminated everything that doesn't belong. Okay. Then it would be just the homeowner's choice as to what height they want this kept at. You can see at one time it was all kind of chopped right down oh, to yeah. about two feet off the ground, and then it's just sprung back up. And there are, there may not be a branch to take down to, which we would normally do, but you can take it down. There's pretty clear buds that you can prune down to that they will send out new sprouts next year. And that'll hide your cut. Right, yeah. If you cut it in between, then you're going to have a dead stem if you just do it randomly. So we just pick and cut right above those buds. And then we'd also prune anything that's rubbing against the house. Otherwise, it starts to make marks in the paint or on the siding or in this case with the stucco it can actually start to damage it and there it was much prettier brand new perfect <laughs> <laughs> So this is a newly planted tree, probably within the last um, six months or so. And what is going on with the volcano we have here? <laughs> what, would it, what should it look like? Well, this is what we f refer to as a mulch volcano. When they pile the mulch up the trunk of the tree, um, preferably the mulch should be two to three inches thick, but then taper down till it hits the trunk of the tree and then it should be at nothing because you don't want anything holding moisture against the trunk of the tree. It um, should look so like a donut. Right. More so than should a pull volcano. it back a little bit. Um, it also appears there's still a little bit of dirt up against the trunk that shouldn't be there. What we like to do when we plant trees is to find a root flare where the trunk tapers out into the root system and that's where it should be sitting level with the ground with that flare just above the soil level. So real gently and excavate out until we find hmm. a nice taper and that's where the tree should be planted at. There's a, quite the excess of dirt as you can see. <laughs> this poor tree <laughs> has been buried in its own coffin. Oh there. Yep there. There we have our flare about four inches too much stuff piled up the trunk of the tree. So how could we fix this? We just did. <laughs> okay, but the way but, the, it will, will there be too much rain that settles in there over time or do you think this will all settle? Well, this could be brought back out, okay. f tapered out some more and uh, remulched, but again, not piled up against the trunk of the tree that far. Because yeah. now we've got nice flare roots exposed and... It should not look like a telephone pole. It should look like one of those kids' drawings that they, you know, usually do when they make a, a tree. They actually put a root flare on there. And that's not necessarily, I mean, it may have been planted right, and then for whatever reason, somebody thought it needed all this up against the trunk, either to secure it. Um, some of the trees from the nurseries, especially lindens, have a very poor root system, and so I think they're... They're planted deep specifically in the nursery just to keep them upright. And then when they're planted, nobody knows that. They plant it right where the dirt level is on the root ball. And then the tree gets larger and then it starts to rot where all that dirt's been piled against the trunk. So at planting time, you need to find out where it starts to flare and that's where it should be planted too. And then staking, a lot of people leave the stakes on too long and the tree will start to grow around them. It should only be staked for about a year if it needs staking at all. And then sometimes if trees are planted too deep, will their roots start coming up to the surface more? Sometimes the roots will come up. Sometimes the roots will circle around the trunk. That's called a girdling root. And as that root gets bigger and the trunk gets bigger, it will start to strangle the tree and kill it eventually. 
And that's another nice thing when you excavate out to find the root flare, sometimes you do find a girdling root and you can cut that and solve the problem before it ever becomes an issue. Okay, this tree looks interesting. It looks kind of gnarled. What do you think it is and should it be here? I'm pretty sure this is a buckthorn, although it's much larger than most that people encounter. I mean, it's as tall as the second story of this house, so it's up there 20 feet. And as you can see, oh. it's peeling the paint off the side of the house. <laughs> yeah. Probably damaging shingles. Um, it's a very invasive, non-native species. Um, we recommend getting rid of it. Um, it does put on a ton of berries, which the birds deposit all over the place. Um, and they can take seed under spruce trees uh, in pure shade. They'll take full sun. So the recommendation on this would be get it out of here. Um, if you're looking to screen one window or the house from the other house, the neighbors have planted some balsam or Fraser fir to kind of create a screen here. That's a far better choice than this buckthorn, which I'm sure nobody planted. It just came up and nobody's taking it out. Now it's gotten to the point where it would be uh, quite the process to get it out of here. Yeah, they were originally brought in as nice windbreaks. So they're sh they usually look like a bush, but this one's pretty old. Yeah, they can get quite large if left unchecked. So how could somebody identify that they have this in their yard if they do? Uh, during the summer, the leaves are very glossy. Um, the lenticels on the newer bark um, are pretty distinct and when you cut into it you have a orange and yellow layer under the bark which is also very distinctive and many of the smaller branch tips come to a very sharp point hence the term thorn and buckthorn and if we cut this right to the base there is potential that it could sprout right from the stump absolutely there'd be 50 sprouts back here next year so one this big I'd recommend just grinding the stump out Welcome to the mailbag. Sally from Altoona wants to know more about oak wilt. Well, oak wilt is a lethal fungal disease that affects virtually all species of oaks. Oaks in the red oak group, such as red, scarlet, black, northern pin oak, are most susceptible. Oaks in white oak group, those with the rounded leaf lobes, such as white, burr, post, and swamp white oak, are less susceptible. The way to identify oak wilt is that initially single branches on affected trees wilt and die. Leaves on these branches often bronze or turn tan or dull green, starting at the tips or outer margins. Leaves may also droop, curl, or fall from the tree. Infected trees eventually die. Oak wilt can kill oaks in the red oak group in less than one month. Oaks in the white oak group usually have less severe symptoms and are rarely killed in one season. Oak wilt is caused by a fungus, which survives in infected living oaks and in oaks recently killed by oak wilt. Picnic beetles are attracted to mats of the oak wilt fungus in infected trees, pick up spores of the fungus on their bodies, and then carry spores to healthy trees. Beetles are attracted to trees that have been recently wounded by wind or storm damage or by pruning. Natural grafts between roots of oak trees growing near each other can also survive as means by which the fungus moves from tree to tree. If you want to know how to save a tree with oak wilt, removing infected oaks is often the best way to manage oak wilt. Before removing trees, be sure to disrupt root grafts between infected and other nearby oaks. Destroy the wood from the diseased oaks by burning or burying it. If you decide to keep the wood, remove the bark, pile it in one place, and cover it with a heavy tarp, burying the tarp edges with soil until it is to be used. To avoid problems with oak wilt in the future, prune oaks only during the dormant season when picnic beetles are not active. If pruning during the growing season is required, such as due to storm damage, immediately cover the wounds with pruning paint. Carefully monitor oaks for oak wilt and remove infected trees promptly. Craig from Bloomington wants to know when he can prune his lilac bushes. Lilacs are spring blooming flowering shrubs. Spring flowering shrubs produce flower buds on one year old wood, wood produced the preceding summer. Therefore, you should prune these shrubs right after they have flowered in the spring. If you prune these shrubs in winter or early spring, you will remove many of the flower buds. Spring flowering shrubs that suck are readily from the base benefit from thinning. Examples of sp spring flowering shrubs are lilacs, forsythia, viburnums, honeysuckle, chokeberry, mock orange, and wygelia. If you have summer flowering shrubs, they produce flower buds on new growth in the spring. 
Prune these shrubs when they are dormant or in early spring before bud break. If you postpone pruning until late spring or early summer, you will remove many of the flower buds. Examples of summer flowering shrubs are hydrangeas, roses, Japanese spirea, rose of Sharon, potentella, and smokebush. Broad-leafed evergreens require little pruning. Most grow very slowly. If pruning does become necessary, selectively prune branches back to a side branch so that the foliage hides the prune cut. Broad-leafed evergreens should not be sheared or cut back into older, non-leafy areas as these shrubs lack buds for new growth. Examples of broadleafed evergreens are rhododendrons, evergreen hollies, and Oregon grape holly. Thank you for watching this episode of Keeping It Green, and thank you to Tree Savvy for coming and helping us today identify shrubs and trees and the proper way to take care of them. I hope you join us next time on Keeping It Green. Chippewa Valley Community Television is made possible by continuing community support. If you would like to volunteer or make a donation, you can contact us by calling 715-839-5067 or on the web at www.cbctv.org.